<sighs> Poor unpromoted Ensign Kim must be rolling around in his 600 year old grave. Hello Interwebs and welcome to my review of Star Trek Discovery Season 3 Episode 1, 2, 3, 7, Unification Number 3. So many numbers in this title. But as it, the title indicates, this episode is a direct sequel to the original Unifications 1 and 2 way back in Star Trek The Next Generation Season 5. So, you know, those people that saying that the Discovery writers don't know canon, they know canon. But before we get into it, as always, I'm going to be giving my spoiler-free review up front and then I will be getting into all my spoiler-filled thoughts after I give a little bit of a break. And you can sort of stop there if you uh, haven't seen the episode yet, but you just want my my lovely face to tell you if it's good or not. It is. It is very good. So I don't. I, I don't know. I don't know. I've certainly got all British on you, but hopefully it will make my opinion much more uh, valid and creditable in your opinion. Either that, or all of my UK viewers are saying, "Shut up! I hate you. You're awful." But now that I pissed off a good chunk of my audience, let's talk spoiler-free thoughts in this episode. This was probably my second favorite episode of the season because it was absolutely fan freaking tastic. I still think the Trill episode might be my personal favorite, but this one is right up close behind it. This might, I might be wrong on this, but this might be the first ever Star Trek Discovery episode to not have a single like major action sequence. This episode is all talk and it is brilliantly, brilliantly written. As you would expect from an episode called Unification, this episode does feature Vulcans and Romulans. And whenever Vulcans show up, there's probably a lot of logic talk, a lot of like back and forth debate club sort of things. In fact, there's pretty much a ritualized debate club in here. Of course, the Vulcans would have a ritualized debate club. So there's a lot of logical discussions here. But I like that it, it in Star Trek fashion, uses that sort of discussion in order to have a present day conversation about science, the politicization of science, how science is used to, uh, wielded by different political factions for their own ends, how sometimes facts are manipulated or believed by different groups. There's a lot of, uh, political dissection that you can get out of the main thrust of this episode, and it's all there on the page and in the actual lines, and I loved, loved, loved that here. But not only that, there are, is some beautiful, beautiful theming throughout this episode. The idea of unification is a brilliant theme and title for this episode. Like the original Unification, which was a deep delve into kind of Spock and his character, and while he, the sort of overall plot of that episode was dealing with the unification of Romulans and Vulcans, it was also mirroring the struggle that we had seen within Spock his entire life, the sort of struggle between emotions and logic. And of course, the end part of his life would be about bringing those two groups together in sort of a cultural form, Romulans representing emotions, Vulcans representing logic, and sort of that sort of becoming a political version of Spock's inner turmoil. The same thing happens here in so many ways. Obviously, we have the unification of Vulcans and Romulans here, but without getting too spoilery, we get some discussions of the unification between Vulcans and the Federation, Burnham and Vulcan, Burnham with her own self. The, the, the theme of just unifying and bringing together disparate sides, which is honestly a theme of all of Star Trek. The, Star Trek is all about the unification of different people and the coming together of different groups and ideas to form a greater whole. It, it is the main theme of this episode, and I love how it just brilliantly ties in all these disparate like elements that we've seen growing throughout this entire season into this singular theme in a really beautiful, beautiful way, both politically um, and personally for our characters. Speaking of Burnham, though, this is also a brilliant, brilliant dissection and discussion of Burnham's character. As I was talking about last episode in the past few episodes, this season has been doing a really great job uh, sort of delving into and dissecting and discussing some of the ways that Burnham has been characterized through the past few seasons. And I really like that it's really being delved into here in a way that feels weighty, meaty, but also kind of um, giving us some interesting resolution to her current arc. With, again, without going too much into spoilers about where that resolution goes, I do think it's a a brilliantly beautiful emotional piece here. The final two bits that I also will say, speaking on the unification theme, is there is some brilliant unification of the Star Trek canon in this episode. As is obvious, there's the direct references to Star Trek The Next Generation as well as Spock in unification, and I like the references that they bring up in this episode specifically and sort of uh, globally. Again, I don't want to spoil too much because there's some 
fun little Easter eggs might be too wrong a word because they're very obvious, but there's some fun little connections here between not only the original series Spock, earlier seasons of Discovery, Next Generation, but also, again, without spoiling the surprise, there's some good connections to uh, even more recent series of Star Trek. Again, I won't spoil which ones, but there's some surprising connections that I did not expect that I was really enjoyed. And so it really feels like this episode in many ways is also unifying all the disparate pieces of canon and saying like, hey, this all fits together. Everything that you've seen in Star Trek does fit into this one box, and this is actually all canon. I know there's going to be some YouTubers out there that are going to be very upset about that and rant their rants at somebody about why this isn't true and this makes no sense, yada yada, but I, I thought it worked really beautifully within the episode, and I'll talk more specifically about that in my spoiler section. The only negative I really have for this episode uh, overall, before I get into my spoiler thoughts, is there are a few um, narrative conveniences, I'll say, that I wasn't the biggest fan of, but I felt that they were in service of telling a larger, more important character centric stories and sort of like getting out some stuff that I think a lot of us didn't really care about out of the way. So while there are some plot communities, I'm like, okay, that's a bit easy. I, I kind of see that you're kind of do taking the easy way out to get here just to have this sort of moment. Um, I think they were in service of the larger narrative and didn't really take away too much. They were just sort of like, oh yeah, I, I, I kind of see the conveniences here. So other than that, I really think that this episode was top notch, a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, successor to the Unification series and just a great episode of Star Trek Discovery overall. Let it not be said that Star Trek Discovery is a pew pew only show because it has some really, really meaty and thoughtful discussions, uh, not only this whole season, but in this episode in particular. All right, now that I've given all my spoiler-free thoughts, you can get out of here if you haven't seen the episode. Go! We don't want you here anymore. Get out! Shoo! Bad. Don't leave me. But yes, I'm going to get into my spoiler thought, spoiler thought, spoiler thoughts here, uh, and so jump away if you haven't seen the episode yet. And happy Thanksgiving to everybody, by the way, if you celebrate it here in, the, in America. But jumping into it, first scene up, we get a uh, nice little officer's log from Burnham reminding us that she has been kicked out of the first officer role. And she's kind of unsure about if she wants to stay in Starfleet or, not, or if she wants to, to leave Starfleet for good. Um, and we get some sexy, sexy symbolic undressing with uh, Book undressing her Starfleet uniform. Very sexy, very symbolic. I was in for it. That's I, if all my symbolism could be this sexy, I would be I would be a very happy gal. Then we get a scene with uh, Burnham and Book in bed post coitus, if you will, if uh, for being adult here with our adult words. And they have a nice little conversation where they bring up Spock, and they uh, it's sort of a nice little reminder that she is Spock's brother, uh, which sets us off for stuff later on in the episode. So good little like seeding that exposition here for people that need reminders of that apparently. And I also mention I also love the fact that she calls out that. She loved Spock and that, you know, he loved her back. It was a it was a nice little scene and again sets up the episode brilliantly. I I'm liking these sort of building of the character arcs throughout the episode. It's it's very well done and seated here in a you know, sexy scene. Then we get a scene between Tilly and Burnham, which is mostly an exposition scene, sort of showing like, oh, there is a source of the burn. We can sort of triangulate it. I like the fact that they call it that triangulation in 3D space is a big deal and much harder than a 2D space because everyone seems to forget that in Star Trek. Whenever we look at like star maps in Star Trek, it's always two dimensional. I'm like, space, space has more dimensions everybody in case we forget that. So I like that that little call out here. Um, but I also like that they mixed in this exposition scene with the stuff between Tilly and Burnham and Tilly, Tilly like sort of calling Burnham out um, and saying like, hey, you left me in a very awkward position by not telling me these things. And it would have been my choice um, to tell Saru. If not, uh, you should have you should have at least come to me. Uh, so I, I, I really like that scene. Uh, and I think it set up uh, Tilly's responsibility uh, and sort of discussions that'll be happening happening later on this episode. But, but a fun little scene. Then we get Burnham and Saru going to the Admiral to tell him about this information that they found out about the burn. Uh, and again, we get a little bit more of an exposition dump here. We learn that uh, there was this data that they need in order to help triangulate where the burn actually happened. They need a little bit more data from these satellites that were all around the Federation. But these satellites were created by Navarre, which we now know is the new name for the planet Vulcan after Romulans have come to, uh, to Vulcan, presumably after the destruction of Romulus. I do find it funny, considering that there's a lot of references to the series Star Trek Picard later on this episode that they don't actually explicitly reference at any point in the episode that Romulus was destroyed and all that sort of Romulan diaspora that Star Trek Picard itself, the show, was uh, was dealing with so much in its first season. So I'm surprised they didn't explicitly call that out. It's not a big deal, but I would have thought there would have been someone mentioned like, hey, Romulus was blown up and that's why Romulans eventually settled over on Vulcan. Um, but I, I 
I guess they just didn't want to mention that. Um, the only thing I'll mention in this scene, I like that the the Admiral has this like like sort of like aha moment smile when he realizes like, oh, we could send uh, Burnham's sister to Navarre in order to get her to convince the Navaris, Navari people, the Vulcan Romulan people, whatever we want to call them, to rejoin the Federation or at least open up negotiation talks. That makes perfect sense, especially considering that Ambassador Spock was the one that helped unify Romulans and Vulcans going back to unification parts one in two as we saw and i love burnham's reaction to learning that information she has this like breakdown of like learning how important spock was to the vulcan and romian people and how much he went on to achieve in his life it was a a really uh beautiful beautifully acted moment by sneak martin green there that i thought really worked uh as well as the admiral smile i thought the admiral smile just it just warmed my heart and then when we cut back after the commercial we learned that the romulans on uh, navarre actually wanted to stay in the federation and the vulcans wanted to pull out because they believed because these sb satellites were being used to create a new form of instantaneous travel kind of like the spore drive that because of that that they were the cause of the burn and so because of that guilt they felt that the federation forced them into that that they were forced to call caused the burn, thereby didn't want to be involved in the Federation at all. It's a great little, uh, like, sort of interesting nuanced political situation there uh, that I thought was a brilliant sort of thing that showed, like, oh, the Federation, uh, as, as they referenced later on in the episode, uh, saw the many over the few and neglected uh, the few uh, and maybe have, like, caused the whole burn. And the Vulcans feel and Romulans feeling a lot of shame for that. It's a wonderfully nuanced little political uh, entanglement there that I really, really enjoyed. Uh, Burnham goes back to her, her room and we get a scene from Unification 2. We get to see Leonard Nimoy here. Uh, I, I thought it was a brilliant little Easter egg. It was a nice little call out to sort of see that sort of bring back and, and reminding people of Unification 2. And also tying together the, the fact that Ethan Peck Spock, as we saw in Season 2 of Star Trek Discovery and will be seeing in Strange New Worlds, does eventually grow into being the Leonard Nimoy Spock that we see in the original series and the movies and eventually unification over on TNG. Uh, and, and so I like that sort of emotional, that sort of visual connection between the two as we got the little flashback and Burnham just kind of breaking down and crying at seeing his video as I broke down and cried just seeing Leonard Nimoy. I mean, anytime I see Leonard Nimoy in an emotional scene, I I just bawl. Um, and so it was a, a, a really beautiful moment where she's like, I never let myself feel like figure out and see what happened to him and and just knowing that he went on to achieve so much um was was it was just a nice little beat and a nice little like i said earlier unifying canon um because a lot of people i know out there is like oh discovery's not canon i don't believe it's canon uh da, 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 all these things and i i just like the saying like no this is still part of that next gen canon leonard nimoy spock is the same spock that we saw in discovery um and is, that is burnham's sister so uh, i i like that little moment i also like book calling out like i said earlier chronic overachievers wonderful i, I love their chemistry and him sort of calling her out on that uh, we also get a picard reference in there too which was kind of nice that this was a sort of reference from picard's uh audio log so we also get a tng reference there as well but then we get to a scene that is probably going to be one of the most controversial ones of the episode if not the most controversial one of the episode and that is the tilly and saru scene where saru asks tilly to be his first officer and i'm going to talk about this whole storyline because there's only like three or four scenes throughout the episode and i figured it's just easier to talk about it here and then we'll, we'll get back to the main plot of the episode but so the scene was really brilliantly done, this first scene with Tilly and Saru. I think I liked that he says, you know, you are ready for being a first officer, and we've seen that she's ready to be a first officer through some of the moments over the past few episodes, um, with an asterisk on that. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, so I, I like that beat, and I like Tilly sort of bringing up all the thoughts that a lot of us are having. It's like, I'm not ready yet. I'm an ensign. Uh, are you telling me to take this job because I'm going to be compliant and not push against you? Um... All of these are fair questions, and so I think Saru handles them ably, and I like that they're sort of the questions that we would ask in this situation. I still don't know how I feel about Tilly being promoted to first officer, and I feel like there's a lot of people that will end up being on both sides of this debate, and I, I, don't, I don't definitively have an answer for this. Um, it feels in a way like the writer's kind of cheating a little bit to continue Tilly's story. Tilly's story from day one on Discovery has been that she wants to be a captain, that she wants to learn how to be a captain to grow up to be a, a captain of a ship one day. So we kind of already knew that she was going to have this trajectory throughout the series. So something like this had to happen. She had to get promoted at some point, and it would be a disappointment if maybe at some point in the series she didn't get to become captain, or we didn't learn that she eventually becomes captain. So I understand 
the desire to want to push Tilly up in rank. But to first officer feels like a big jump for an ensign, and an ensign that still feels unsure of herself a lot of the time. Not to say that every leader needs to be like the most sure, no, needs to know all the things, the, you know, have all the confidence in herself. I don't think that that's the case. I still think she has a lot to learn and, 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 and pushing her up this far, I don't know how I feel about it. It, it doesn't feel like it's completely earned in my opinion. And, but I'm open to being, I'm not like dead set on that. I'm open to it. And I'm open to the fact that the show is acknowledging that she's like still going to be an ensign. She'll be higher in rank sort of officially, but she won't be actually promoted in rank. So she'll be above people, but not really. So I like that the show wasn't like fully making her like an ensign to a commander here. So there's some acknowledgement of that. Um, so, you know, I kind of have to see where they go with her character in the next few episodes to sort of see if if it feels true to her that she is able to have this sort of first officer commanding presence in a way that feels uh, like she's she's kind of earned it while also still balancing the fact that she's still learning to be a first officer. It's a very kind of tightrope thing to do with this character that I can see working out well, but I can also see working out really badly. So I'm tepid. I'm very tepid on it. Enough being said about that. Let me talk about the rest of this sequence too. She goes to talk to Stemets who gives her like, I'm weird. It'd be weird to take orders from you. And I'm like, gosh, dang it, Stemets, you're a jerk. I really think you're a jerk. And, I, and I'm someone who likes Stemets and I know people find him to be kind of a jerk, but I, even I thought that scene, that, that was a jerk scene to say it would be weird. Um, but I also like the knocking from OO on the glass and like, uh, there's this like simmering underground, like referenced rivalry between Stemets and Detmer going on uh, for the past few episodes that I've just kind of like that, like just running gag that's in the background there thought that was really nice but then we get the final scene between uh between tilly and everyone and it's a really wonderful scene where they all say say yes i i teared up i i will admit i got emotional even with all my trepidations about tilly becoming uh first officer that scene got to me and i like that stemmets was the one that sort of initiated it and then the grievances section was very very funny um, and I liked Burnham showing up a little bit late and kind of uh, having that emotional moment with Tilly, kind of paying off the beginning of the episode, but also their friendship and also the fact that Tilly knows that she's going to be taking over Burnham's spot uh, on the crew. And I liked it, even though we haven't talked about it yet, I liked how it kind of capped off Burnham's uh, sort of role in all of this episode too. So uh, I, I thought the scenes in and of themselves were all very effectively done, which has me encouraged for how this storyline will be handled going further. I just have an issue with the whole conceit of it or at least i have trepidation with the whole conceit of it of tilly becoming first officer and i also again i have reiterated this but i really like that the show allows these characters to feel and show emotions that they're not just all like stiff like i can't show any emotions that this is a very emotional star trek and some people have a problem with that i think in the future people would be willing to show their emotions more unless they are vulcans and don't wish to which is totally fine i appreciate that i liked it uh i'm just sort of nervous on the whole concept but we'll, we'll see how it pays off. I, I'm willing to be proven wrong. Uh, in fact, I would like to be proven wrong. Anyways, let's get back to the rest of the episode. So the crew of the Discovery jumps to Navarre, which used to be Vulcan, and we meet President uh, to something. I don't know. Why do all Vulcans have to have a T, an apostrophe at the beginning of their name? I don't know why. But uh, we meet to somebody, I forget, to Tavar. She's she's well played. I like the president of Vulcan, but for some reason I did not catch her name uh, because all Vulcan names sound alike. And I know that's racist, but deal with it. Uh, I like her for showing up on the bridge of discovery. I thought it was a good introduction to her character that she was had deference towards uh, Burnham, um, but was a little hesitant about the Federation in general for obvious reasons, but then also being very unwilling to showcase, to show and hand over the data uh, from the from the SB uh, satellites and, and not really trusting the Federation, but still wanting to like at least open relationships with the Federation because of Burnham being there. Um, I thought that that political nuance was all very brilliantly handled with this character. Um, I also really liked the Vulcan Romulan symbol that they all wore on their chest, which is a combination of the Vulcan symbol and the Romulus symbol. Really great job there. I thought that was a nice little, a small little touch between these characters. But then Burnham invokes the, I also didn't, I wrote this down. I'm sorry. All the Vulcan words, I'm going to screw up this. Set. But basically Burnham invo invokes this ritual that is basically a Vulcan high stakes debate club, because of course they would have a Vulcan high stakes debate club at Ritualized high stakes debate club totally reads to me like a thing the Vulcans would have, of course. Um, and so she invokes this. And I, I like that there's a little bit of tension between her and Saru. 
uh, here where Sora's like, Commander, what did you just do? But he doesn't like call her out too harshly on it, but he he does kind of take note and sort of says, you're, you're doing the thing again where you do things without me consulting me first. You, you, you keep doing that. So I like that there's that little like tension there in that beat between the two actors. Very well played. Um, I think the only, the only thing that I will say here about this, and this is one of those narrative cheats that I was talking about in my spoiler free section is what's the rush? I get that the burn is this big mystery that Burnham wants to solve. And I, I get like, she feels this impetus to get it done. So I, I can believe it coming out of like a personal place. And maybe that's enough for this scene. But there's an element of me of like, again, I don't get why needing to solve the burn is such a pressing, I need to know right now mystery. Again, I get it for Michael Burnham as a character. I don't necessarily get it for us outside of it. It's like, I am interested in learning what caused the burn. I'm, I'm definitely intrigued. But why does it need to be solved right now? It's been waiting for a hundred years. What's another few years? What's waiting a few more years to open up diplomatic relationships with the Vulcans? What's what's with like waiting just a few more months to sort of negotiate this and, and do diplomatic channels instead of like putting everything on the table and maybe risking a relationship with the Federation here? It reads good for Burnham as a character, but it just sort of reads weird as like, ah, oh, we need to get this done. We need to solve this burn mystery right now. And I'm just like, I don't buy that it needs to happen right this moment. Why does it need to happen right now? Um, but again, if you read it as a character flaw of Burnham, which does kind of get dissected later on in this episode, it works. So I'm willing to kind of give it a little bit of a pass. But it is something that bothers me that the show is like getting me like, you need to solve the burn right now when it's a mystery that's been waiting for hundreds of years. Like, I want to solve it, but I'm not like, oh, I need it this exact second, at least in terms of the in the universe. Maybe as a viewer, I have that impetus too with as Burnham, but um, that's sort of my big problem there. But it's a minor quibble. Then we get the, the Vulcan president beaming up to the ship in a couple moments between her and Burnham and Saru. I loved this scene. I thought it was really well handled where she's like, you're putting me in a really harsh political position. I'm not entirely sure I trust you yet, which again, pays off later on in the episode. Brilliantly set up there. And again, really love the nuance of the political situation going on here. Uh, and then we get reference to the Quat Melot, which I really, really loved. And again, there's that unification idea of the unification of all the different canon. We had unification of previous track, but I like that they're bringing in elements from Star Trek Picard, the Quat Melot from that show, and just referencing all of that canon too, saying it's all together. It all fits Picard, Discovery, TNG, TOS. It's all here, baby. It's all there. Uh, I, I thought that that was really brilliant. It was like a surprise little extra piece of canon that I did not expect. And I like that it's sort of this integration of Romulan and Vulcan cultures that haven't all completely fit together. But you see that the Quetmalat have been added to, to Vulcans, uh, to the Vulcan rituals. So I like that sort of unification within the rituals itself between what we've seen between Vulcans and Romulans in Star Trek Picard and the development of Star Trek uh, Romulans in that show. Uh, so just, uh, again, many layers of unification going on here on a meta level and, and a textual level. So really brilliantly, brilliantly done with bringing the Quetmalat. Then we get another uh, narrative conceit where the Quatmalot who shows up, who is the one who's going to be the advocate for Burnham, turns out to be Burnham's mother. Another bit of a narrative cheat that I don't want to spend too much time on here, but it did feel like a, a bit convenient. It's like, okay, of all the people in the galaxy who, who can be here at this moment, of course, it's the one person who has a relationship with Burnham, the only person at this time in Star Trek history that we know would be around here. And this other mystery that we've been wanting to solve happens to be the Kuat It's a bit convenient. Um, that being said, while this is probably the most convenient thing in this episode that I'm, I, I'm kind of like, okay, you're really stretching my credulity here, considering they were talking about credulity earlier on in that scene. I'm okay with it a little bit more because it works well within this episode. I like her presence as a bouncing off of Burnham. And I think having her here works well for the main thrust of the story. So I'm willing to forgive the convenience a little bit, but it is rather convenient that she shows up. Again, I like it in service of the larger story. And also it kind of dispenses finally with the where's the mother mystery. I didn't really care. To be, to be very frank, I didn't really care too much where her mother was. I was like, I could take a leave ever finding her. So I like that they're just sort of like, yeah, and she's here now. We're not going to like spend a whole episode going to search for Burnham's mother, which would have just like made me kind of bothered and annoyed. I really wouldn't have cared all that much. So I'm like that it's just sort of like a thing that happens that she shows up. Uh, just it was a bit convenient that she shows up here at this moment in this scene, but it, it's in service of something better. And and so I, I, I'm, I'm okay with it. 
But speaking of which, we get some really brilliant scenes. I like the, the referencing of absolute candor, that she always tells the truth, again, tying into Star Trek Picard in a really nice way, that she's able to read Burnham really well. Um, it makes sense that she's having followed Burnham her whole life. She knows a lot about her, works well. She's sort of sitting, again, the political situation where we have different sects of Vulcans, which really work well, and the reference of, you know, different, they have different facts, they have different beliefs uh, that they reference as facts. I really, really enjoyed uh, all of that. And then getting into that, we finally get the actual ritual itself. And I loved all the interplay here and all the different uh, little political machinations. You know, if I had more time to like sit here and analyze each one of their arguments, um, it would work very, I think it was really intelligently done. You could see that they were really seeding and really thought out the different sects of Vulcan culture that would be going on or Vulcan Romulan culture that would be going on during this unification process and that they still haven't all fit together quite well. And a lot of the arguments are stuff that I, I, I see on arguments all the time on stuff like the internet where they're, they're you know the Vulcan guy the main guy in the middle who is just sort of saying stuff like oh you're being too emotional you're making an appeal to emotion uh just like references to that and you can see again this idea that you know science there, there are basic scientific facts but then they all get politicized for different gains and different belief systems which you know if that doesn't speak to what's going on today it, I don't know what does. If we don't see the politicization of just basic scientific facts for their own ends, I, 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 this is a very prescient episode, even though this was clearly written before then. Um, so just a, I think a really brilliantly done sort of concept here. Um, again, I could probably spend the whole rest of the review just talking about the different, um, Vulcan ideas that are brought up here, but I, I'm just going to gloss over it for the focusing on the Michael Burnham stuff, but that by no means uh, is meant to dismiss the very wonderful work done on building up Vulcan culture here. Uh, really brilliant job. The other thing too that I really want to mention here uh, before I get into the final little piece of this episode is I loved the scenes between Saru and the president of Vulcan. Um, I, I really love that she sort of brings up this thing as like, I don't really trust the Federation. I'm kind of hesitant. They There was more to the uh, the breaking apart of the Federation and Vulcan than just like the the burn and, and uh, the CB satellites, that there was just a lot more to it. And it was sort of the Federation just consistently ignoring Vulcan and letting us go and, and still need to uh, to focus on too many people and it got too big. Um, I, I really liked that that idea there. And Saru's sort of saying like, no, we can still get back to the core Federation values. I still believe in it. Um, you know, we paid a heavy price. Uh, really beautiful stuff between her and him that I, I deeply, deeply enjoyed. And I think my favorite moment out of all of that is when the president said, you know, there's a lot more that needs to be fixed here. And Saru doesn't say like, well, we need to fix it now. He says, I would just like to hear it. Saru diplomacing like a boss is another note that I wrote there. He's just such a good captain. I love him. Um, I just absolutely adored that moment where he just sort of says, I, I'm an open ear. I'm not going to dismiss your grievances in order to get what I want. I want to hear your problems. And so I thought that that was a really just beautiful moment between Saru and the president. But then we get into the actual like meat of the episode and probably my favorite scene overall, which is Burnham's mother takes Burnham aside and says, you're not telling the truth. You need to tell the truth here. Um, and you need to let these Vulcans know what you're actually feeling. And then we get the mother jerk scene where they go in and, uh, you know, Burnham's mother just comes after her and says like, you're not telling the truth. You did all these things, you know, how can we trust you to stand for the Federation when you don't even always fight for the Federation? You're always being, you know, you're always betraying the Federation. So it, are you, do you really believe in the Federation's values? Again, calling out sort of, sort of stuff that people have been calling out about Burnham's character, but also about the show in general. A lot of people said like, oh, you know, this show at Discovery has been like diminishing the Federation and saying it's too dark and the Federation doesn't stand up for its values anymore, things like that. And this show is showing us in this episode that no, what Burnham was doing was believing in those ideals believing in the greater principles of the Federation. And so she was always fighting for those ideas. And I love when she just gives it right back to her mother's like, Have, haven't I always tried to do these things? Haven't we always overcome these odds? And really hitting at the theme of unification, but the theme of Star Trek in general. She has this wonderful lines like, we are imperfect, we are flawed, we make mistakes, and yet we keep fighting for these ideals. And that's something that she says about herself and something she says about the Federation uh, and what she speaks to, speaking to the Vulcans like at this time is like, the Federation's failed you, but we will still fight for these values even in all of our flaws and we still can be better. And I, I, I it just it really hits at everything I love about Star Trek and I thought it was brilliant. But then we get her giving a personal moment too. It was like, I always stood up for these things, but I f have fear. 
a fear of making a mistake, fear of screwing up feeling. That's where this feeling of not belonging comes from because I've lost certainty in myself. Um, and that's the thing that resonates heavily with me of losing certainty and feeling nervous and scared that I'm going to mistake, make a mistake that hurts somebody. Um, I feel that so much of the time as, as like a creator with a platform who tries to talk about issues, I worry that I use my platform incorrectly. I'm sure all of us feel that in our own ways, in our own lives. That's just how it comes out in mind in some ways and just anxiety and fear um, working our way through our lives. And I love those shots of Saru in this moment where it cuts to Saru and him sort of starting to get like he's shocked uh, at Burnham thinking of leaving Starfleet, but then he sort of starts to get, uh, oh, I see where she's coming from. I see where her pain is. And I'm sure that that's going to be, you know, spurn him coming back and reconciling with Burnham later on this season. And so small little subtle beats by Doug, uh, Doug Jones here. And I think um, Burnham, um, Snooker Martin's green is showing her uncertainty and uh, uh, lack of confidence in herself, but also the confidence in the moments where she needs to have confidence were all portrayed excellently well. So Snooker Martin green uh, and Doug Jones just do a, just do a phenomenal job selling that scene. Um, it, it was very well acted, extremely, extremely well written. Um, and then I like that it kind of plays into the, the Romulan Vulcan stuff going on here too, with Romulan saying like, no, we're going to back out. We're going to, we're going to get out of here. Uh, we're, we're leaving Vulcans. And she's like, no, 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 no. Unification is more important. Sticking together, believing in our values, coming together to form the greater whole, like the Federation does is the more important thing. And I will not tear this, this union apart because of my pursuit of this this goal and i like her coming to realize that that's the larger goal here of bringing people together it's not about this pursuit of the burn which again gets me into the thing is like why do i care about the burn if it's not the main the most important thing um not that it needs to be necessarily but we've talked about that already but i like that it shows you know, the principles of Star Trek, the principles of the Federation, and the principles of what it means on a personal level and on a political level. It's just working so many ways, so beautifully and so intelligently throughout this episode. It just was weaved together so well, so well. Um, and then we get to the final scene. I'm just going to try and wrap this out a little bit where we get the final scene between um, Burnham and her mother. I think a little bit overacted. I think there was a little bit. It was. I mean, not that it wouldn't be an emotional moment between the two of them, but I, I thought that that was well written. But I think a little bit overplayed for a moment. Um, but I did really love the line that Burnham's mother says. I'm just so glad that to say, like, I will always be here for you. And that's something that she hasn't been able to say Burnham's entire life. So I, I think it was very well written scene. Um, and I, th I think for me, a tad overplayed by Sonequa Martin-Green and, uh, the actress who plays Sonequa Martin-Green's mother. Um, but generally, a uh, very, very solid scene between the two of them. And I liked that it turns out that even though Burnham gave up her, you know, pursuit in the, the Vulcan ritual, the president was the real, um, the real audience there. And Michael Burnham's mother knew it the entire time. She knew how to play that scene and how to push Michael to get her to the point that she needed to get to convince the president. And the president was willing to take on the risk of the political um, action of, you know, giving her the data and taking on all the weight of that and whatever the political ramifications for that are in order for Burnham to, to have this data. Uh, so excellent, excellent job. Uh, brilliantly written scene. Um, and then we get a last scene with Burnham and Book. Uh, thought it was, you know, nice that, you know, it was sort of little circling back to where we started off the episode where she says, you know, I belong here. I'm part of Starfleet. I like that it sort of concluded her arc there. Uh, but we, a good reference to Book not knowing what he means now. I'm sure that will be explored in later episodes, but I like that it's sort of like she's saying, I love you. We no, not really love, but they, they feel comfortable with each other. Um, and they feel like home, but that, but Book doesn't really fit into Starfleet. And so there might be a little bit of a um, metaphorical thing going on there with maybe Book will eventually join the Federation or join Starfleet and sort of showing this sort of reunification of his sort of his sort of more uh, Han Solo-y type of ways and how that can maybe fit into the larger Federation as the season goes on. So a nice little setting up for his arc going forward here, uh, being tied to Burnham and Burnham bringing him into the fold and sort of unifying him in his own way. So I'm really enjoying that theme. So I know I've ranted for longer than I expected to, but there was just so much in this episode. Uh, this, like I, like I said, this might be my favorite or at least second favorite episode of this season. There's so much being done here on a thematic level, on a character level. It all interweaves with each other really well. It weaves in 
so many disparate parts of Star Trek canon in such a beautiful way, but also sets us off in a new course for Star Trek canon and one of the most important and one of the cornerstones part of Star Trek canon, which is Vulcan and Romulans. Those are some of the first bits of like major Star Trek mythology that we ever had. And we have charted a brand new course with both of those civilizations in a way that is brand new for Star Trek and yet completely fitting in with the themes of Star Trek as a whole. So I I'm loving this tying together of every part of Star Trek, the, you know, the original series era, the next generation era, the discovery era, the modern era with like Star Trek Picard, just brilliantly done. Uh, I, I I've said more than enough about this episode, but I cannot praise it enough. I have a few minor quibbles of some of the plot conveniences and some stuff with Tilly that I'm sort of keeping my eye on, but on as a general whole, brilliantly brilliantly done episode and well worthy of the name unification part three in fact might be the best of the unification episodes as much as i love Leonard nimoy's part in those episodes the original two unification episodes were not great on a plot level great for spock but and for picard and sarek uh but not necessarily for the overarching plot of the, those two episodes so great episode of unification now that i've destroyed my my comments by dissing unification part one and two i'd love to hear what you thought about this episode down in the comments below don't forget to subscribe don't forget you can also help me out on Patreon as well. And I hope that you, as always, live long and prosper and have a wonderful Thanksgiving and a safe Thanksgiving if you are celebrating it. Thank you so much to all of my patrons, especially Catherine Lambeth, Ashley Allen Bokikio, Miranda Janelle, Eli Berg Moss, Ashlyn Solstice, Greg Gillum, Stephen Kleinard, Randy Thompson, Chamomile T, Philip Sorbello, Munir Amlani, Boyd and Mary Beth Earl, Stefan Schuthart, Wellington Marcus, Wayne Twitchell, Buttoneer, Ish the Mad, Dominic Noble, John Steele, Gavin Robinson, Michael Beam, William Stewart, Nathan Olson, Amanda Ronnie Indange, The Sir Spence, BBD, Hannah F., Miguel Posadas, Jason Knott, Maeve, Andrew Jorgenston, Sabraxis, Jasmine, Chris Brown, Bree Beecher, Nathan Steele, Chloe Dollar, Jane Packard, Dante St. James, Wendizzle Bizzle, Geek Filter, Mark the Edge, Pissed and Twisted Garage, Gretchen Badger, Sarah Bystam, Celestial Dawn, Polly Mina, Din, Jean Mithoon, Lysa, Andrew Lamoro, Zone One Librarian, Michael Hardy. Thank you, all of you, especially this month.